Why are sinc and square a Fourier transform pair? And when I say square, I'm talking about this function here, the rect function in the time domain. And the Fourier theory tells us that its Fourier transform is a sinc function, this function here. So let's look at some intuition about this. And one thing people often ask is how can it possibly be that a square function, a function with these sharp corners, can be constructed by adding together sinusoids because sinusoids are smooth. But that's what Fourier tells us. So how can that be? We're going to look at that. Another question then is if you assume it can be, you would think probably that a sine wave that has a period related to this time period here that goes up and then comes down, that sort of sine wave, that that might play a fair role in generating this waveform when you add it to other sinusoids. And the time period across here is capital T, so you would might think that a frequency of one divided by T would have a fairly important contribution in generating this waveform. But when we look at sync over here, one on T, there's exactly zero contribution. So why is that? What's some intuition about why the one on T frequency contributes absolutely nothing to generating this waveform? We're going to look at that. And if you're wondering why we're looking at these signals at all, then you might like to follow my Instagram feed and Facebook page where I'm on a quest to find fig signals in everyday life. The details are in the description below. Of course, also subscribe to this YouTube channel for more videos. So let's look into this. We're going to do this by starting with this waveform here. It's the rect function over this time period, but then we're repeating it at 2t and 4t and so on, negative 2t and so on. So this is a periodic repeating function, obviously very closely related to this function. And by looking at this one, we're going to get some intuition. So one thing we're going to start to do is to think about how do we construct this signal here from sinusoids? Well, let's look at the zero frequency sinusoid. Well, that's one that doesn't vary. That's a constant with time. Uh, and that's this function here. And I think you can see this is going to be a component of this function. So if you had to generate this, you would first of all start with this function of a half because half the time this is what equal to one and half the time zero. So a function which is flat for all time, a value half, that's going to be a fair component in generating this signal. That's the zero frequency. So now let's look at the fundamental frequency. So the fundamental frequency is one divided by 2t. So that's this sinusoid here. And yes, this sinusoid, it goes up and down over this period here. If you add this one, because this is going around zero, if we add this one to the zero frequency, then we're going to have a waveform which looks like a smooth version of this square repeating waveform here. So it makes sense that we would be having a component of this in this waveform. Uh, what about double this waveform? The, I should point out that, of course, the only frequencies that can exist in this repeating waveform are multiples of this fundamental frequency. Because if you had any other frequencies, then when you add them together, they wouldn't result in a repeating waveform. I think that's easy to convince yourself of that. Uh, if not, I've got a video on the channel that relates to that. So take a look at that video. But we know that they all have to be multiples of this frequency here. So here's the first multiple, two on 2t. Two this is one on 2t. Two this is two on 2t. Two I'm going to come back to this one. Let's look at this one here. So, so far we know that we're going to add some of this to this to generate that. It seems like a good idea. What about this third one here? Well, this is three times the fundamental frequency. So there's three periods in every period of this fundamental one here. So now we start thinking, would we add any of this frequency here to this waveform when we're trying to generate this one? And the crucial thing now is to be thinking about this actual transition. That's the key to all of this. Let's think about this transition at t divided by 2. Let's look down here. So this waveform here, this one that we already think is going to be a good contribution, to generating this waveform. Uh, we're trying to make this square 
transition here, this sharp transition. We're trying to make that by adding together all these sinusoids. So this waveform here, the fundamental one, that we notice that that has a negative gradient at that time. And so that is going to contribute to making this transition, which is a very sharp negative gradient, an infinitely sharp one. What about this third one here at three times the fundamental period? Well, this one is going in the positive gradient direction. So it's it is a gradient, so we think it might help us, but if we multiply it by negative, then it's going to be in the right direction to help with this negative transition that we've got in the waveform we're trying to generate. So here, uh, as just to say again, this one, you can see it's going in the positive direction if you just put the positive of that waveform. So if we put the negative of this, then that will help to contribute to making this transition sharper because this transition wasn't as sharp as it needed to be. So we're going to have to add higher frequency components to it. We'll need to add a negative of this frequency component. And just at this moment, let's just look back up to this sink. Um, this sync, of course, relates to the rect, which is not repeating. But just for a moment, let's link these two that we've looked at back to the sync. This one was at 1 on 2t. And at 1 on 2t in the sync, it says we need a positive amount of that frequency. This one was 3 on 2t. And we worked out we'd need a negative amount of that frequency to have the transition going in the right way. And sure enough, when we look up here at 3 on t, this is this value here, the sync function tells you a negative as well. So we're starting to get some intuition on the sync function by looking at the waveforms that we would need to construct this waveform. Um, we're going to look at another waveform which is closer to this one in a minute, but just before then let's look at this waveform. This is twice the fundamental frequency, and in this case it's 2 on 2t. Two in this case, is it going to help us at that transition to form that transition? That transition? So let's look here, capital T on 2, as we look down, for this waveform, the gradient is 0. It's exactly at the bottom of the sinusoid. And in that case, it's not going to contribute to helping us form this transition when we add it to the others. It's a 0 gradient. So therefore, this waveform does not help in the construction of this waveform. Therefore, we would have zero of this component. And of course, twice this fundamental frequency in this case is two divided by two t, which is one on t, which is exactly the one on t over here where the sync function tells us a zero. So hopefully this gives us a really good insight into why there's a zero component of the one on t frequency, because the gradient of that waveform at the time instant where you're importantly trying to generate this transition, the gradient is zero. So this waveform does not contribute to forming this waveform up here. And so therefore there'll be zero component. That's why the zero crossing here. And then I think if you went to a higher frequency, so the four divided by two T, you'll see the same thing that there's a zero gradient and therefore there will be no component of 2 divided by t. Likewise, when you get up to 3 divided by t, there will also be a zero gradient and zero component. So hopefully that's giving you the intuition you need for these crossing points. So we've answered that question, the crossing point question, but what about the question of why this is a fully filled in sync for this rect? So far, we've just got these discrete ones. Well, let's move to a waveform which is a little bit more like the rect than this one. This one was a waveform that repeated periodically at 2t, uh, which was just twice the width of this uh, time that it equals 1. But let's move to this one where we move the repetition out. So we still have the same square function, which is between this minus t on 2 and t on 2, but now it doesn't repeat until 4t. And what's the Fourier transform of this going to be? This is still a periodic waveform, so we're still going to have finite frequencies to add, but they're not going to be the same as these ones. And it's going to be a little bit more like this one. And I think you can imagine by looking at this at 4t, it, well, then you can imagine it at 8t and even bigger, and you could sort of imagine it at an infinite time, and then you have the rect function. So let's look at this one first. So the zero frequency component now, it's only one a quarter of the time. So this will be a straight line at a quarter. The fundamental frequency now is 4t. So you've got one on 4t. There'll be a component of this. Again, we use the same important 
observation that we're trying to generate this sharp transition at t on 2. So here, the gradient here is negative at capital T on 2. So this is going to help us in generating that transition. Uh, what about twice that frequency, 2 on 4t at t on 2? It's also a negative gradient, so it will help us to form that transition. At 3 times the fundamental frequency, we also have a negative gradient, so that will also help us to form that. When we add them all together, this will help to make this a sharper corner. And what about at 4 divided by 4t? Well, at 4 divided by 4t, in this case, we look and we see that it's a zero gradient. So this one will not contribute to helping with making that square transition when we're constructing it from adding sinusoids. And what's special about this one? 4 divided by 4t equals 1 on t. Again, it's exactly the 1 on t that the sinc function has no component of. It's exactly the 1 on t over here that this one had no component of. It's just that now we've got it out at 4t. So it's a it's, there's more of these components before we get to that frequency where there's zero. And so now we can see, thinking along those lines, is we've got now three frequencies at, at a quarter t, that's here, at two quarters, which is a half, that's here, at three quarters, which is here. These are all positive in the sinc function, and then one on t here. So now the difference between this function and this one is that now we have more components filling in before we get to 1 on t. But this zero crossing is still at 1 on t. And so we've got more of them here than we had here. And so again, if we make this period even bigger, I think you can imagine there will be even more filling in here. And if you made this period infinite, then you would have an infinite amount of infill and you would have exactly this sinc function. And when they're infinitely far apart, it's exactly the rect function. So hopefully this has given you more insights into the rect and the sync. I'm now going to show some MATLAB plots to sh actually show the constructions and you'll see the constructions forming. Uh, and so that should hopefully provide more insights for you as well. So here in the top plot, I'm showing the repeating square waveform between zero and one. And in the bottom plot, I'm showing in the frequency domain, the sinusoidal components which go together in the construction to make that waveform. We're going to see that waveform being constructed here. I've only shown the green continuous sync function as an overlay uh, so that you can picture the sync function. But of course, this is a repeating function. It only has these discrete components as we've discussed. So let's look at the first component, which is the zero frequency component. Yes, that's a straight line at 0.5. The next component here at a frequency of 0 0.5, uh, we're doing this for capital T equals one second, uh, is this function here. So I'm just plotting the component here, uh, and in a minute I'll add them all up. But this is just the component here. It's a positive component of that frequency, cos wave. The next one is going to be the component at frequency 1, which is, of course, zero contribution. Uh, the next one is the component at 1.5. And we can see this has got the negative uh, amplitude because at the zero time, it starts uh, with a negative value. So it's an inverted sinusoid, or, or in this case, cos wave. Um, but importantly, the important thing is at the transition time, t on 2, which is 0.5, uh, this, both of these waveforms that are contributing, the yellow one and the green one, both have the gradient in the correct direction so that when you add them together, you're going to start to form this sharp square of the blue overall waveform. Uh, the next component is, of course, zero at the two frequency. The next one at 2.5, uh, of course, smaller amplitude. Uh, as you go up in frequency, you're getting more and more accurate and more and more precise uh, of smaller changes around this uh, edge here, and you're not wanting to disrupt the rest of the waveform. You're wanting them all to be cancelling out. Um, the next component is zero. So now I'm going to I plotted each individual component. Let's plot them as they add. So now we're just showing between zero and one the same function. We've got the zero component here. We're now going to add the first component to it, and so that gives us this waveform here. This is the the first and second components added together it gives you the yellow one. Now we're going to add the next one. Uh, which is going to be giving us the 
uh, here uh, and then we're going to add the next one which is the 2.5 and you can see that it's getting more like a square waveform. I'm now just I'm not going to keep them on the graph anymore after this I'm just going to show as we go even more terms that aren't shown in the graph below but that exist and so we can see that as you keep adding terms in that sinusoidal um, sequence of terms you get more and more like the square waveform. And now in the top two plots I'm showing the plots we just showed with the time domain sequence that repeats every two seconds and the frequency components and in the bottom plots I'm showing where we have the repetition every four seconds and those frequency components and as we discussed there's more of them and let's step through those frequencies as we add them. So this is the first term here, the DC term of an hour a quarter. And now we're adding the second term here to it. Uh, we're going to add the third term to it. We add the fourth term to it. The fifth term is the zero term, so that doesn't change it. Then the next term is going to add the negative waveforms, which are going to also be contributing with the correct phase on that transition at uh, half a second here because this is being done for capital T equals one second and then as we add the increasing terms up here towards the end we see that it gets to the same waveform that we had above except where there's zero between the now period of four. Uh, and so the waveforms are being formed in the same way with these two pictures but there's more terms in the bottom and I think in your mind's eye as you make the period go out from four to be even bigger, there will be more terms on the right hand side and you'll move towards a sync function. And so now on the bottom we're plotting the rect function which does not have a repeating square wave and its Fourier transform the fully filled in sync function. And you can see on the left hand side as we go down the graphs the period is increasing and the, the bottom period is infinity. And on the right hand side as we go down the graphs we fill in the sync function more and more with more and more resolution as we go down. Um, the last thing I think people often wonder about is the amplitude of the sync function because as we've gone from this top left uh, top right hand to the middle right hand uh, we've doubled the period and we've doubled the infill and we've halved the amplitude. Um, and yet at the bottom we're showing a sync function which has the same height as what we're showing in the top right hand and that can be confusing. The important thing to remember is these bars that we're showing when we're showing the discrete components uh, those are actually delta functions and delta functions have infinite height. They have zero width. What we show when we plot is a height which represents their area. So it's not actually a representation of their height, it's a representation of their area of those delta functions. And that's an important property of the delta function. So when you have more of them, uh, the, there's, the area is less, um, but there are more of them. And so when you add up the area over the whole of frequency, you get the same value for each of these three curves. So that's an important thing to be understanding when you're relating the discrete periodic to the continuous uh, function. So if you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up, like the video. It helps others to find the video. Um, subscribe to the channel for more videos and check out the web page in the description below where you'll find a full categorized listing of all the videos on the channel.